So um, I just want to welcome you to our to our online event series. Um, so just to give you a bit of introduction on access, those of you that have not um, joined access before, we are an employment services agency. Uh, we are non-for-profit and we have offices all over the GTA. And we mainly support newcomers um, and looking for their first job in Canada. So those of you that are in pre-arrival mode, uh, planning your um, arrival in Canada as well, we do have a and Canadian Employment Connections program as well. Um, I do have Stephen Chase with me here today, and he is going to be our keynote speaker. So I guess we can begin. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, again, welcome to, I was going to say, actually, maybe it should be four components to professional mm -hmm. su success in Canada. The one I'm not going to talk about is, because you've already done it, you've connected with Access Employment, and that's probably going to help you significantly to achieve your professional success in Canada. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself in a moment, but I just wanted to start by saying that uh, I feel like I've worked in the newcomer services sector for many years, doing different kinds of programs and services, pre-arrival, um, people for uh, programs for people in the workplace, as well as career uh, recognition, credential recognition, and issues such as that. But I think whenever you do anything for a long enough period of time, you stand the opportunity to understand what are the really core aspects to what it is that you do, whatever your career is. Like think about if you're an accountant or an insurance or whatever it is, if you've done it long enough, you probably know what are those one, two, I think in this case, the three components that are needed to do what it is you do effectively. So after many years of working in the sector, this is these are the three that I've found to have um, a big part in finding career success in Canada. So I'm glad I get to excuse me, share those with you. So today we're going to talk about self-care and mental health. We're going to talk about parallel, parallel career opportunities. You could call it alternative career opportunities. You could call I just call it more opportunities. <laughs> and then we're also going to talk about intercultural communication, and that also could be referred to as cross-cultural communication or um, cross-cultural competency. So uh, this is what we're going to talk about today is not as complex as molecular physics, but uh, some of these topics, particularly the intercultural communication one, it does have a lot of subtleties and nuances. So uh, I, I got my good friend, President Barack Obama, to take a photo to encourage you to listen closely so that you don't miss those subtleties and nuances because they can really help you to uh, implement those in the workplace or in, in your general life in Canada. Uh, so I know how a bit, a bit ironic it is to ask you to turn off other technologies, and uh, but I encourage you to put your feet up and uh, listen in as we go through this. So a little bit about myself. Uh, as I mentioned, I've delivered a kind of range of programs and services for people that were new to Canada. The one on the left you see there is the Integrated Pre-Arrival Services Online Project, and that gave people in the latter stages of immigrating to Canada uh, language training, job search, connection to potential connection to Canadian employers, mentoring by someone in their occupation in the province in which they were destined to go, and some intercultural communication programs. And I'm proud to say, well, it was still called Citizenship and Immigration Canada back then. They have an awards that, that they uh, give out every year. And uh, in 2013, that project won in the overseas category, so the people that weren't yet in Canada, the pre rival uh, aspect of that awards and so the project ran from 2009 to 2012 and it won the award in 2013 so very proud of that but it hasn't so now you can go to access for your, your program <laughs> that one doesn't exist anymore uh, I started uh, my career in the Nova Scotia Department of Labor and Workforce Development working on a team developing a whole host of career planning resources for youth and adults and uh, online and print and as part of our efforts uh, we received a, a little golden swirly thing as a, a, a ministerial award for excellence, so very proud that we were able to achieve that. We were doing some innovative things, although that was quite some, some time ago, but uh, yeah, very proud of that. And then also I worked at Ryerson University uh, where we took that intercultural communication component to that pre-rival project and they wanted to put it inside organizations, businesses in Canada, so that they could help their employees to communicate better across cultures. 
And we had pretty good success in, in a very short period of time. We had companies like Lombardi Transportation, Bruce Power in the city of Ottawa, and the Canadian Institute for Health Information, and a whole host that were uh, took that program and offered it to their employees to, to develop their skills. And I mention that because I think that highlights that the issue around intercultural communication it is a factor and it does matter because businesses, not just with the Ryerson program, they do training and programs. I think even access has delivered some sort of components like that uh, to help employees in the workplace. So it does matter. It may seem less important than some of the other aspects of job search, be it the resume, the interview prep, but it really is an important piece. Uh, so I hope I encourage you to look into that more. And then credential evaluation uh, provider help do different programs and services to uh, help better include and integrate internationally educated uh, individuals in, excuse me, in Canada and work business development for private company and then started uh, Gate 21 which is I think a culmination of what I've tried to do and trying to help the sector move ahead and advance and, and work on the immigrant settlement sector instead of just in it as well. So helping organizations to further and achieve their missions. Okay, so that's who the person is talking to you on the other, other side. So I think a good spot to get started is, of course, why not with ourselves and self-care. Now I hope I can impress upon you that these issues I'm about to talk about are very important and they can have a very significant impact, either positively or negatively, on your ability to achieve your professional success or your goals in Canada. So I hope you uh, do some consideration about that. So there's a growing body of research that shows that mental health is an, in an issue that uh, immigrants are facing more and more as they launch their careers and their lives in Canada. Uh, and there's a wide array of reasons for that, from the devaluing that can happen of your professional experience that you gained outside of Canada to sometimes encountering unconscious bias or in some cases conscious bias, lack of credential recognition of your foreign education, and then generally just uh, the, the overall process of acculturation. So when someone is from a different culture and they're learning how to adapt and integrate into a new one, that can cause stress, stresses and pressures. And again, the research has been growing in this, and there's a gentleman by the name of Dr. McKenzie, who he himself is a British psychologist who immigrated to Canada, and he's been looking more and more into the issues around mental health uh, when it comes to Im excuse me, immigrants. And he works at the Canadian, uh, no, sorry, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. And he shared a stat once I, I found kind of concerning, and I suspect you may as well. Um, upon arrival, Immigrants stand 4%, you see the 4% there, risk of uh, developing a health issue. And then after seven years, that risk grows to 17% of developing a health issue. Now, he didn't specify what portion of that was a physical or a mental health issue, although I think really they're in some ways one and the same. He made, a, I think, a astute point that without mental health, there is no health and sometimes we don't really place enough attention or focus on making sure our emotional well-being is in the best place that it possibly can be. But, uh, I mean, if you look at who's on this webinar that we're talking about, we had, if, say, 60 people registered when you first arrive, about two of you out of the 60 and 4% could face a health, mental health issue, or whether that's a health issue and there could be mental health is involved in there as well. And then after seven years, that goes up to, I think it would be 10 of you. And it's not... Once we got to the 10 people, all the other 50 are okay because health and mental health is fluid. One person could be dealing with it at one point and then they address it and get better and another person could be dealing with it later on. So it's not like you're, you're in the clear after you reach the quota of how many people have encountered the problem. So it's important to, to keep, and even in the general population, I think it's in one in five people will encounter a mental health issue over the course of their life. So it's, it's, it's not insignificant by any means. And I was introduced to this topic uh, when I was speaking on a panel, and you can see a video caption and the link to uh, her name's Dr. Helena Zika. So she did some research around the loss of professional identity. Yeah, right there. And uh, so uh, she found that it can happen more and more uh, with people that are in healthcare sectors say than IT, and there's a lot of reasons why you may uh, 
assume that to be. If you're in a health profession, it's somewhat more regulated and can take a longer time to <laughs> restart your career. Um, and um, and whereas in health, uh, IT, if you know HTML5, it's the same here as it is in California as it is in it, excuse me anywhere. So it takes probably less time, and you're less likely to encounter some of those uh, mental health issues. And and of course, for, but for all of us, our our career holds such significance to how and who we identify ourselves, and it makes sense. We spend most of our time working. So uh, ever since that event, I've been pursuing the issue around mental health in relation to internationally educated professionals. And there's a little bit of work that's been, been done on this, but I think more and more, so I'm hoping to kind of continue this and push this forward. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of part this section by sharing a story I saw on uh, a New Canadians TV, which is a great resource. I would encourage you to check it out, Google it. But uh, they shared a story of a gentleman that was from Pakistan. And he was a news anchor at the top of his career. He interviewed world leaders, Secretary of State Clinton, and he was addressing some really uh, important and, and challenging issues in Pakistan at the time. And actually, at that time, it became more and more uh, risky for journalists, and so he moved to Canada. And you would think with someone with his prowess and success, and he thought this as well, he shouldn't have any problem relaunching his career in Canada. Unfortunately, that wasn't the experience that he had. He actually did a documentary about the challenges he faced. So he couldn't get interest from anyone in the media sector here, couldn't get any leads, any opportunities, and it led him to have to move in with his brother, who was, by the way, an internationally educated uh, engineer, which took him eight years to get back to his career before, where he was in his career before arriving to Canada. So you can imagine you know, successful journalist had to move in with his brother and his family, and the stress that that could place on him and his emotional well-being. And, and I don't want to make it sound all doom and gloom, but lots of people through organizations like Six Access can achieve their success quickly, but research does sort of show it is taking people a little bit longer to relaunch their career compared to people, say, 20 or 30 years ago. So I just it's important that, to know that this can have an impact on your mental well-being. And, and it's not really just the individual, it's also the family, because when you're struggling with mental health issues, it's, that family can be impacted in it as well. So, and the issues around mental health aren't as, uh, they're not as uh, significant as the, say, just the clinically depressed or uh, bipolar disorder or things like that. There are many levels of mental health, so it can affect many people, and it does affect many people in Canada uh, around, uh, for, over their life. And, Despite that, there still exists, exists a stigma to the topic about mental health, and people aren't as comfortable talking about it. It can have a negative uh, connotation, and, and there are some organizations that are working to reduce that stigma. There's the Bell Media Let's Talk campaign. They're trying to help to get people to talk about it more and more, so I hope I'm just impressing upon you that this is something that is an issue and that uh, to take heed and, and, and consider it. So, there's a wonderful person by the name of Paula who works for Access, and she does excellent webinars and presentations about job search. She says, if you should hire about 30% for networking, I don't know what the numbers are, I haven't heard in a long time, but 15% uh, for online because most jobs aren't posted online, so don't spend too much time there. But I would suggest that you carve out a portion of your time to make sure that your, your self-care and your mental wellness is in the best condition that it can be. Uh, maybe switch to the next slide, Nick. Uh, I've been trying to explore this uh, about some, there are of course in-person resources that you can access and there's a little picture of a navigating mental health services in Toronto. That's a guide and the URL is there. That talks about mental health a lot more uh, broad, broadly than we have time to hear because it's, for some it's a new concept. But it also tells you about what resources are available to you that you can access, so I would encourage you to, to take a look at that. Uh, I like to use technology. I've been exploring different <laughs> online apps, although the one I found right there on the left is on a, it's on an I, uh, Mac, an iPad, and I don't use those, and I struggle with understanding how to use them. But I would just encourage you to take a look at what's out there, because when I take advantage of technology, it's a lot more uh, uh, available than it used to be. And I guess. Um, just to be proactive is my parting thought on this. 
If it's like you're driving around in your car and you're looking at the gas gauge and it's almost on empty, you run a greater risk of running out of gas and being stranded on the highway. So I would encourage you to fill up more frequently and you will reduce those risks. So be proactive with ensuring that your mental health is where it needs to be. Okay, uh, next slide. And it will really power your ability to achieve your professional success in Canada and general life happiness as well. So parallel careers. Um, I think this is a good diagram of how to look at what opportunities exist for you. Many people in Canada, my, my colleague here sitting with me, Rebecca, she trained in HR. I took a look at her LinkedIn profile, but she trained in HR. She took that track, and there are, of course, lots of people that go in the linear path, and they achieve lots of success. But there are also people that take a more worldly path, and they may get an education in one field and work in another. And uh, it happens more and more due to the dynamic nature of work in today's economy. So uh, they can shift from different industries, different sectors, uh, even different occupations. So I think actually for some of you that are in the process of coming and some that are just in the process of going through job search, you're really in a significant point of transition in your life. And, and along with that comes some challenges and opportunities. So I think now might be an ideal time to really examine where you were in your career and where you want to go and to embrace the idea of reinventing yourself. Because in many respects, when you're immigrating, you are reinventing yourself. So why not take the time to do that? Now, in my work years ago around career planning and labor market information, this would be sort of the, the, the points that would get people to look at. And I think often people will look at the experience, the education, and the skills. And those are important. But again, since you are in the process of really reinventing yourselves, I would say look in some ways more closely at the goals and the interests and the values. You know, why did you pursue the career that you wanted before? So for example, my, I have nothing against you know, making profits and, and uh, you know, business deals, but my work, what a goal and a value for me was that my efforts had a positive impact on the society. So what opportunities could I do that would enable me to do that perhaps that I haven't done before? And, and that's what I mean by parallel. It's just to say, what work have you done before that is somewhat related to what you could do that's different? Uh, and I don't want to use myself example, but I had a psychology degree, then did PR, and although I used a lot of those, the components of those educations, I never never worked in a PR agency. So that's just to hopefully give an example. But another way to maybe get inspiration is to look at people's LinkedIn profiles. So people that are in Canada and see, did they follow a, a more linear path of the career? Did they weave and get inspiration of where they took their careers? So maybe just to use one uh, specific example, we'll look at the next slide about biotechnology in that sector. So uh, I think there are actually probably many more arrows in between there, but I think this is a good, good point to start. If you can imagine, let's say you worked uh, well, actually, legally, you could probably work in any of those different, you could transition to different you could policy, you could go to regulate, regulatory bodies, or maybe even academia, I don't know. But uh, if you worked in a university, you would certainly be qualified to work in science writing or regulatory. And just to give you a sense, you could go all in between those. But I also wanted to share uh, a story about a friend of mine who, in each province, there are what they're called sector councils in some cases. And they're sort of a, a, an industry association, a, a body that's meant to try and promote a specific sector. And uh, so they do a number of things. But a, a friend of mine who had experience in business development and worked internationally saw an opportunity for to do uh, business development internationally for a, for a uh, biotechnology sector council. Now, they didn't have any, very little, if any, experience in the biotechnology sector, but they did have those other two pieces around business development international. And they, they interviewed a couple times for the job. I don't know if they were successful, but it's just, I think, to I think encourage and, and inspire you to think creatively about where opportunities may be. And then I guess two final ones that I'll share about alternative careers come from healthcare. Uh, in Toronto, I know from the, no, we'll just say that, uh, from the uh, Toronto Financial Services Alliance, there will be over the course of the next few years a lot of job opportunities in the insurance sector. Now, uh, if you don't have an insurance background, or, but perhaps you come with a nursing background, you could find work in the, in, the, in the insurance sector, I don't know what the term is, adjudicating or evaluating claims and also policies 
So you could take that healthcare background and put it in place in a completely different sector. And then I've also heard a, a gentleman, uh, he, was the, he was the director of international education for a college in BC. His wife was originally from uh, Western Europe, was a nurse, didn't want to go in the lengthy process to get really licensed to practice as a frontline healthcare professional. But she started working as a, we call it a technical advisor on an IT company that was developing a healthcare program platform for frontline healthcare workers. So she could still use her expertise and still serve the purpose that she wanted with her career was to help people to live healthier lives. So I hope that that kind of inspires you to think differently. And the last one, and Access can probably help you with this, is entrepreneurship. Uh, I've dipped my toe now into entrepreneurship with Day 21, and I consider it a social entrepreneurial venture, but keep in mind entrepreneurship is not for everyone. You need to be comfortable with some uncertainty and dynamic flexibility in your lifestyle, but it can be very rewarding in its own right. And so I think Access has a, a bridging program and other programs that can help people explore that possibility. So. Okay, uh, yeah, next slide. <laughs> okay, I mentioned earlier about not using Macs. I like to use the analogy, we're going to talk about intercultural communication now, and I like to use the analogy of two leading uh, software companies, is, uh, Apple and Microsoft. Uh, Macs have a reputation of being very simple to use, and that's why there's, if you can't see the image, there's a little young child joyfully playing with a very childlike looking computer, and the caption says, Using a Mac, yeah, it's kind of like that. Now, again, it does have a reputation for being easy to use for young people or, or people that aren't familiar with technology or older people, perhaps. Uh, I can say I don't look like this little guy when I use Macs at all, and I'm relatively savvy with technology. I could take a course and probably get used to it. For my PC friends, when my wife asks me to do something on a Mac and I close something and it disappears and I have no idea where it went, I need my taskbar. I need to know where those things are. That's sort of like intercultural communication. It's, it's the operating system. It's how we make sense and interact and, and organize our world. And uh, next slide, I guess. And, and so a lot of times people think about culture and intercultural communication with, in a way that this uh, cartoon sort of highlights. It's, it's sort of those surface level, really visible pieces, pieces like your traditions and your norms. You see a one guy, why isn't he taking my card? Or one person perhaps in a different, different idea about personal space and this general overall anxiety with it all. Uh, intercultural communication and cultures go much, much deeper than that. It is our operating systems. <laughs> Next slide. And when we talk about culture, this, these, the analogy of a, an iceberg is often used. So we saw the last slide where they're talking about things above the visible culture, so those customs, the symbols, the behaviors, the dress, the traditions. Those are more apparent, but much of culture exists below, when using the uh, iceberg analogy, below the waterline. You can't see it. It's less visible. So that's the, uh, those are the worldviews, the assumptions, the beliefs, the values, the norms, the attitudes, all of those. And if you put some effort into understanding those more deeper culture issues, you will absolutely uh, supercharge your ability to achieve professional success in Canada. Uh, just generally, but also specifically in Toronto, because uh, the population is so diverse, you will work with, uh, most likely will work with many people from many cultures. So if you don't have this skill, you will, you'll, you will have, if you do have this skill, you'll be at an advantage over other people that don't have it. Um, so we're going to talk briefly about these. We'll start with, yeah, next slide. So this is going to be a brief introduction. This is a much broader topic, but hopefully this encourages you at minimum to use the car analogy again. If you're driving along, you're going to pass one, whether you drive on the left side or the right side, make sure you check your what's called the blind spot. So you over your left shoulder or right shoulder before you pull the pass so that you can get to where you want to get to without any problems. I, I hope it to be a little bit automatic. Think, okay, I'm going to pass it. What's the cultural impact here? You know, so you always think of that. So what we're going to talk about now are generally to be the case in terms of the cultural norms in Canada. How are you doing the time? Okay. Um, so a culture can be defined as a collection of beliefs, language, customs, traditions, 
values, norms, all these that are characteristic of a group of individuals. And these, these guide the way that we interact with each other and including and particularly in the workplace. Now, let's examine each of these in a little bit more depth. So we have a belief. Now, a belief is something that a person holds as true. So an example of a belief is, say, some cultures believe in the idea of life after death, and some cultures do not. And it's important to note, I used it as sort of a spiritual uh, context. Beliefs don't necessarily have to be tied to religious or spiritual beliefs. It can be many other things. Um, so that's a belief. Uh, then we have a value, and a value is what someone feels is important. So for example, someone may feel that it's important for everyone in society to be treated equally regardless of their status uh, or, or any marker of who they are as an individual, where someone else might not find that to be important at all. So that's a value, for example, a value. An example of a norm is something which uh, a person feels is an acceptable thought or action. Okay? So, an example of a norm is some believe it's acceptable to interrupt while someone else is speaking and some do not. Did you notice? Rebecca and I have not interrupted each other. It's kind of a representative of the Canadian uh, workplace culture. You wait for one to, to finish. In most cases, this is all generally the case. Culture is very situationally and, and dependent. You know, as I mentioned at the outset, saying Canada, Canada is generally an equality-based culture. If I didn't mention it, it is. But if you work in Canada's military, that is not an equality-based culture. It is, by definition, a hierarchy-based organization. So some of the norms and values that you would find broadly in society, you wouldn't find in that workplace. So it's all dependent upon your situation. So again, this is generally the case about Canada. So being an equality-based culture, that means the belief in Canada is that society is better for all if full equality is honored, okay? So whereas, and, and culture isn't that one culture is right and one culture is wrong, it's just different. So you just need to be aware of the differences. And because it has a significant impact on how we work with each other. Uh, in a hierarchy-based culture, for example, it's believed that society is better when statuses and hierarchy are recognized and respected. That's how society organizes itself. And when it comes to values, in a quality-based culture, values, they believe people of all ages, genders, uh, family associations, social economic status, despite any of those differences, everyone is considered equal. So for some of you, this may be very different. I mean, what I would ask, what do you think of that? You know, what, does that seem very different or foreign? And I'd also ask, are you still heeding my friend Barack Obama's listening closely, because this is, this is where those, those nuances will come to play. Um, in hierarchy-based cultures, there's great importance that's placed on status, and, and this is derived, funny enough, uh, from those factors such as age and gender and occupational level, your position in society, your family association, so kind of the, in some ways, the opposite of what you would find in a quality-based one. A norm in an equality-based culture, that would be where people are allowed to uh, serve as group leaders, if, if should they choose to do so. And they can debate with each other, and it's believed that uh, effective social interaction can only exist when people are considered equal. Now, to do that in a hierarchy-based culture, you know, those are based in, uh, people figure out how they interact with each other on those affiliations. It's how they connect with each other and how they establish, again, those interactions. And this, again, all has impacts on how we uh, interact with each other in the workplace. And I want to share a couple stories with you that I think, I hope, illustrate this. So uh, I worked with a gentleman from Turkey, a wonderful guy, and Turkey is a bit of a hierarchy-based culture. Now, he did report to me, I was his manager, but I guess coming from a higher kind of quality-based lens, I wanted really active and involved participation in the things that we were working on. You know, I wanted constructive feedback, even though he was someone that reported to me. And oftentimes I would simply get, it's good, sir, or that's wonderful, sir. And interestingly enough, both being referred to as sir, you know, I'm a relatively young person, and throughout my career I've never been referred to as sir, which is something you may find common in a hierarchy-based society, but it's something that I didn't experience very often. And, 
And I even, and, I, and we were working on this intercultural communication program, and I encouraged him that, you know, maybe to uh, be more involved and proactive in terms of his involvement in our, in our work, and suggested there may be some negative implications to some of those behaviors about using sir or formal languages that are a bit less common in the Canadian workplace. Uh, because they can have some negative impacts. I, I like to view myself as an open and, and accepting person, but some people are not. And, and in some cases, these behaviors could be viewed as being representative in, incorrectly of, say, a lack of confidence or uncertainty. And in Canada, self-advocacy and uh, self-promotion are really important in terms of progressing in your career. And so if you demonstrate in some cases the opposite of that, people can, in some ways, pass incorrect judgment about who you are and your abilities. Uh, and I guess when I left that job, I, despite all that, I encouraged the senior management that he be considered as my successor. And he was well educated, a couple degrees, an MBA. He was qualified, a little bit lower on the management experience, but I thought he could, he could do the job. But I can't help but think some of those practices that he demonstrated around you know, made it may seem like he was a little less confident. Were played a factor in the reason why he wasn't selected to to, to uh, be my successor. And I guess one other educational bit to that story is that the person who was given the job to replace me was from a country that actually had a long and complicated history with Turkey, and uh, that involved, I think, some military conflict. Now, there actually arose some conflict between my former friend from colleague from Turkey and the person that replaced him from that, that other country. And he told me he believed that it was the fact that he was from Turkey that played a role in the conflict that he had with that new manager. And this highlights a very critical aspect to developing strong intercultural communication skills, and one that will really benefit your ability to achieve professional success in Canada. And that is to avoid, at all costs, making assumptions. Again, we looked at the, the cultural uh, iceberg, and we do make assumptions. It's natural. It's how we make logical sense of the word. But if you can do your best to avoid making assumptions, you'll be less likely to make improper associations. So using this example, I can say, I mean, you never know fully what's in someone's mind, but I actually knew the other, the, the new manager, and it wasn't the fact that that he was from Turkey, that there was conflict. It were, there were other issues at play, but, believe, but because he believed it, it was that he was from Turkey, he ended up not staying there very long, and it's unfortunate because I think he could have done well there, and they lost an employee, so it was a loss for all. So that, you know, that assumption played a factor in that, and it's, it's, it's too bad because it was unavoidable. Uh, so yes, please avoid, at all costs, making assumptions where you can. Next slide. Okay, uh, how are we doing for time now? Uh, total five. Okay, yeah, I have my time right here. Run away. Look. Okay. Um, okay. So, in a collectivistic culture, the the, the good of a society is better than is more important than the good of the, an individual. So, in Canada, generally speaking, we have an individualistic culture. Again, I talked about the importance of self advocacy and self promotion. But in collectivistic based cultures, uh, the interest of of families and communities and society as a whole, that's believed to be very important for collectivistic cultures. And selflessness is promoted, and unity is highly valued, and cooperation is the expected norm. And there's a phrase that embodies this ideal, and that's all for one and one for all. So uh, whereas, again, in Canada, we, generally speaking, have an individualistic culture where this places values on individual goals and achievements, and uh, initiatives and self-promotion are, are highly valued, and the rights of individuals are, are very core to society here. Canada has the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which is within the, Canada, within the country's constitution, and this embodies and protects the rights of individuals. Now, and this isn't to say, you can't say, in an individualistic culture you don't collaborate in, in, with different people. We absolutely do, but the underlying, um, even in group works, the, the, the concept is, Rebecca, you do your work, and I'll do my work, and then we'll come together and we'll get to get to our, our shared objective in that manner. Uh, and you'll see a lot of this in the Canadian workplace because there will be a lot of group interaction. So if you're coming through interactions in the workplace from a collectivistic point of view, now again, not that that is wrong, but if everyone else is operating 
from an individualistic perspective, it can cause challenges. Um, uh, and I, I want to share with you a story, hopefully, to illustrate that as well. Uh, a gentleman years ago that I knew worked for essentially what would be the uh, Service Ontario in a different province. And he was from an individual, uh, sorry, collectivistic based culture. And he was working on a big uh, redevelopment of the computer systems. He was in IT. And the project sort of falling behind schedule a little bit. And he took it upon himself, sort of without approaching others or his manager, he said, he, at, coming from a collectivistic culture, he thought, project's falling behind. I need to help out Sue and Rebecca and everybody. I'll go do some of their work and we'll get it going and we'll get this done because that's what we need to do as a group. Although, again, because in Canada it's more use, we're defined boundaries between who's responsible for what, he did it and then actually ended up, he, he, it rose conflict with his colleagues and his manager actually ended up having to put a disciplinary note in his file. This really you know, demoralized him. He became disengaged. Another example of a bit of a cross-cultural impact that had negative impacts for the individual and for the people that they were working alongside. And he was a talented, bright person in a, in a province that needed people like that, and he moved to a different province. I'm not saying that that one instance caused him to move, but I can say it was a bit of an eye-opening experience for him and, and an unfortunate outcome nonetheless. And I think it was definitely rooted in culture, so that's why I wanted to again stress the, the point. Maybe if you can imagine if you had a slider, so a, a scale in front of you, and on one side you had a collectivistic base culture and one you had an individualistic, where would you fit? So Canada is probably three quarters of the way towards individualistic. I don't know if a culture could entirely be an individualistic. I don't know how that would work, but where do you fit? You know, are you closer to collectivistic? What does that mean in terms of your comfort and your preference in workplaces? As you'll see on the screen, uh, Canada and the U.S. and Western Europe are mostly individualistic, whereas in uh, Central and South America and some Asian places in the Middle East, they more follow a uh, collectivistic-based uh, culture. Next slide. Uh, okay, we're good. Uh, <coughs> take a drink here. <coughs> So Canada falls, <clears throat> uh, so a high context, low context communication. Um, Canada falls in a, uh, a, a low context communication style. So whereas, um, again, areas like the Middle East, Asia, South America follow, follow a, a high context communication style. Um, so let's, let's start by looking at high context. So this is where in societies where words are only part of what someone is communicating and how they do it. The context includes things like a speaker's tone of voice, their, their physical expressions, as well as the person's status. These are key components to understanding the messages that are being conveyed. So uh, also, interestingly enough, there's always interplay and interlap between cultural uh, variations. So oftentimes, high, co high context cultures in terms of communication are also collectivistic. And in high context communication in collectivistic societies, avoiding conflict is something that is pursued. So to try to not get into conflict. And high context communication allows for this because it's a bit more indirect. So it avoids disagreement. Uh, in high context, uh, context communication in, often involves, involves uh, elaborate apologies and humility and flowery language. Whereas Low context communication, uh, it falls in a different place in the cultural map here in Canada. It's much more linear, linear. it's much more individualistic, action oriented. It really values facts and logic and directness. It's very straightforward, it's very concise, and it's clear what's being ex uh, communicated and what's expected to happen. So words here are pretty much meant to be taken liber literally, and a high value is placed on precise language, clear documentation, rules and guidelines. So uh, that's what um, high context and low context communication in the world of time uh, looks like. Okay, all right. We will move on to the last one in terms of communication conflict. Some cultures, will, as I mentioned, would prefer to avoid conflict. In Canada, uh, it's not necessarily viewed as a negative thing, may not necessarily be a comfortable one, but it's believed that 
a good can come from discourse and debating and getting through what may be uncomfortable conflict. It can help to uh, identify things that people don't aren't already aware of in terms of the work that you're trying to address. Uh, so try not to, you know, don't don't be aggressive with conflict in the Canadian workplace, but try not to avoid it either. So uh, if you kind of put in some effort, uh, look into some either online resources around intercultural communication, you will definitely supercharge your professional success success in Canada. So to wrap up, we looked at mental uh, mental health, self care, pal parallel careers, and intercultural communication. So uh, I get so enthused and energi energized when I meet people that are new to Canada. I'm absolutely pulling for you. I'm cheering for you. I have a general idea about the commitment that you've made to choose Canada and to make it your own, and I thank you for doing that. And, and you mean such a great deal to this country that uh, I am pulling for you, as I said, and I encourage you to, to go get it. I just want to take that time just to thank Stephen Chase as well for taking this time um, you know, to present to you on the presentation and to hopefully you gain some knowledge just regarding the Canadian culture and succeeding in your respective workplaces. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Yeah, go get it.